my dear friend Kevin is going to join in a moment. Uh, thank you, you Jason. Um, so I'd like to um, just say a few words uh, to introduce uh, Jozen to everybody. Good morning. Uh, so Jozen Tamori Gibson uh, began formal meditation practice in 2004 through Soto Zen while living in Japan, joined by a Theravada practice in 2010. Jozen is a participant in the 2017 to 2021 Insight Meditation Society Dharma Teacher Training Program and also serves on the New York Insight Meditation Center's Teacher Council. With certifications and embodiment studies in yoga, Qigong, indigenous focusing oriented therapy and complex trauma, Jozen lives to provide and nourish contemplative mind, heart, body alignment practices and spaces rooted in wellness, anti-oppression, and interdependent liberation for all beings. Jozen honors the wisdom and compassion of all teachers, highlighting their mother, Kimi, and Dharma root teacher, Pamela Weiss. Thank you for joining us, Jozen. Having me. Yeah, thank you for your guidance and support, Kimi. It's deeply, deeply appreciated. Mm. So again, this is a compassion practice. One of the, if you're familiar with practicing in a meditation center, a meditation hall, a zendo, some places you may see a Buddha on one side of the meditation hall. Directly across, you may see Kuan Yin. Kuan Yin, the embodiment of compassion. In Zen centers, in front of the Buddha is Manjushri, Manjushri being the Bodhisattva, these spirits, these embodiments of wisdom, Kuan Yin, compassion, Manjushri, wisdom. And that is a reminder of wisdom and compassion, this metaphor being the birds, the wings of a bird of our practice. In order to fly and to move with some ease, wisdom and compassion move together. They flow together. When we understand that wisdom is arising but not much compassion, there's some difficulty in how we are engaging in the world perhaps. Or if there's an abundance of compassion, but not so much wisdom that's happening, not so much insight or awareness. Some other things are happening in our world. In the between is mindfulness, the awareness. How aware can we be of what is honoring our wisdom and distracting our compassion or what may be nourishing our compassion and disconnecting us from wisdom. And in this practice, this Buddha Dharma practice, the Buddha believes, as do I, and has taught that we are all innately embodying these levels of wisdom and compassion, karuna. But we have been taught in many ways that hmm, we need to focus on the headspace, the mind, not the wisdom of the hearts, not the wisdom of the body. Gil beautifully reminded us this past week that what is most fundamental in our life is love. And so if that is most fundamental, may that be where we inquire, what is our relationship with love? We may begin with understanding how we define love for ourselves or even how love was defined for us. Coming to 
coming into relationship for ourselves of these terms and this innate being, this innate embodiment, this innate felt sense that may not even have words. Within that understanding, you also reminded us that what is most fundamental is love, and everything is the is support of love. Everything else supports love, and if not, it is the recipient of love. The recipient of love, and so here in this short offering, I like to focus on the recipient piece. This is an external understanding from an internal place. So what if we would understand right, the embodiment, the expression of compassion, the recipients of being everything? What if this form in front of you that a mama named Josen. Right? What if this form is compassion? What if your form is compassion? Within the Buddha Dharma, this also means that there's wisdom that's present. Within the Brahma Viharas, right, these Brahmin abodes, these heavenly abodes, these dwelling places of these attitudes of the heart, mind, body. Compassion, Karuna, K A R U N A. Karuna is when compassion, when love meets the suffering of the world when it meets some external suffering and internal suffering. So there's compassion that is mean that and then our conditioning comes in somehow, some way. You know, at the top of this pandemic, the, the top of it for us here in this unceded Lenape territory in northern New Jersey and New York. You know, this was March of 2020. We became the so called epicenter of coronavirus, COVID 19, for the United States. So many in our community, we started calling coronavirus or COVID-19 the Rona or Rona, especially within our Dharma circles, because we understood Rona as a teacher. We understood that there's something to be learned here. And so how do we receive the lesson compassionately? How do we receive the lesson in the midst of everything else that has been going on in our world, in our lifetimes, for centuries, for millennia? This is what the Buddha saw during his time. This is elements of what the Buddha taught during his time and the ask of his disciples to bring it into our contemporary modern day times. Compassionately, with wisdom rooted in classical teachings, the wisdom of the classical teachings compassionately meeting this day and age, evolving the way in which we meet one another through language, the language of the heart, the language of the body, the disconnect of the minds. practice is how we can bear witness to suffering, how we learn how to accept what is happening, 
without condoning the causes and conditions that brought it forth. Accepting and condoning very different. This practice is not easy, though it is simple. We as human beings just find ways to make it challenging, to make it difficult. Can we learn to be compassionate with each other? But we have to learn to be compassionate with ourselves first and foremost. I want to read you a quote. This is from Tanisha Robiku. And this is a, a piece on educating compassion. It's a very beautiful piece. It goes very deep and wide and spaciously into how we educate ourselves to be more compassionate. So this is just a small quote from a larger section where Tanisha Robiko says, it's a well-known principle in all meditation traditions that a moment's insight into the pain of the present is far more beneficial than viewing the present moment with disgust and placing one's hopes on a better future. Once again, Tanisha Robiku says, and shares that it's a well-known principle in all meditation traditions that a moment's insight into the pain of the present is far more beneficial than viewing the present moments with disgust and placing one's hope on a better future. And so this reminds us of the Pali word, Pali being the language of the written text of the Buddha Dharma, the Buddha's teachings in Pali. The word for mindfulness is sati, S-A-T-I, right? Many of you are familiar with this. Many of you have heard it translated as such as mindfulness. I feel it's very important for us to remember a key definition of sati being to remember to remember. We're all going to have our unique doorways and entryways into what we remember and how we remember our conditioning. And what this practice is asking us to do is to be in awareness of our conditioning, to study and investigate mindfully through the body, through the heart wisdom of our conditioning to decondition ourselves, to decolonize the ways that we have been taught to be in this world, this world that centers division. That may not be your unique world, that may not be your embodiment, and yet we are living in a world that very much feeds that and nourishes it and supports it and funds it. So accepting that and not condoning. There's um one of my favorites, this is not a comparison, this is not a, a hierarchy, but favorite in terms of how it resonates with my body. <clears throat> there is this group called the NAP Ministry, NAP Ministry. You can find them online, social media, websites. A beautiful, beautiful group that directly centers a form of compassion that is rest and learning how to rest. Right? It goes against the stream. Against the stream is the way that the Buddha taught this practice. This is going against the stream of um, dominant 
culture, the dominant culture that says we need to do, 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 do. That's a lot of do's. That says, no, there's no need to be. Let's not focus on being. The body and the mind will follow, the body and the heart will follow the mind. Wherever the mind goes, the heart and the body will go. And that's just not true. If our bodies break down, the heart breaks, our mind fights itself. Can we learn how to be in relationship, this deep, compassionate relationship with our bodies, knowing our capacity levels for any given moment? Many of us are engaged in the world. For some during this pandemic, we have learned folks who have been deeply engaged in the world for generations and generations. Right? We call them frontline workers. Do we understand the ways in which we need to be in relationship with our capacity in this moment to be of support for other people, other beings, all beings, as best as we're able? So there's this grand wish that we practice on behalf of all beings, all sentient beings, billions and billions of beings. But yet in our worlds, right, these smaller pockets of the world, this like Joe Zen's world, for example, on any given day, I may be able to be in connection with you know, five people, like actual direct one-on-one connection. I'm not talking about online in this way where so many millions of people can connect. I'm gonna talk about how we connect one-on-one -on -one or two-on-two -two or small groups. Right. Be mindful of how much energy it takes to engage. We need to eat. We need to rest. We need warmth. And we need shelter. We need water. This is my throat reminding me to take a sip. This precious element here. Being in gratitude with all of these forms, not taking them for granted. Allowing ourselves as well to rest, to sleep as a necessity. Some people say, well, when I meditate, I fall asleep and I don't want to do that. So what if we shifted our attitude and our perspective on that? Sometimes when we sit to meditate and we start to fall asleep, yes, we may understand sleepiness as a hindrance, as something that we don't want. But what if it's something that we actually need in that moment? And what if that meditation was soothing enough that allowed us to be who we needed to be in that moment, and that's to sleep. What if? And then it could be the intention at another time if we want to feel into the intricacies and the wisdom that sleep provides the body, then, yeah, then we can have a little bit more intention and bring some more energy into that intimacy with sleeping as we are meditating. And sometimes when we're sleeping, we bring that inquiry forward. Oh, let's get curious about this. Let's get curious about this felt sense of sleepiness. That in itself can bring some energy but we want to be mindful of how we do that. That level of energy that comes forward, it can be a way of striving. It can be this subtle way of wanting to do more, wanting to overcome sleepiness. No. We're not interested in over 
overcoming anything we're interested in being with and allowing that to be our guide through understanding. Again, accepting as it is, not condoning. Compassion, Karuna. This is how we begin to remember in the moments or we come into relationship with understanding the heart body as wisdom, just as we understand sleepiness as wisdom, as compassion, as a place of awareness. Before I close here, I just want to say something about um, there's been a lot of conversation and a lot of investigation and reinvestigation into what compassion fatigue may be for folks. And I am of the deep belief, this is through my own practice and what I've seen in my teachers and my elders, for example, and even the youth and beautiful guides for me over the years that <clears throat> compassion itself does not fatigue. Same way as we understand wisdom itself does not fatigue, awareness, mindfulness is not anything that has a finite limit to. These are very deep, old wisdom energies, ancient energies, ancestral energies old present to be energies we'll be so lucky to get to a point where we could actually view the fatigue of compassion <laughs> i don't believe that to be possible yeah and so what is actually happening is the mind may be fatiguing. The mind may be bumping up against something. The heart may be bumping up against something. You know, I can go into a million different things. I can go into a million different stories of how we may be othering, pushing away. This separation piece. And so what actually may be happening is within this realm of what some of us are calling like these far and near energies that are either opposites of compassion or masquerading as compassion, right? You may have heard of these as like far in their enemies. Um, I like to refer to them as imposters because they're impersonating our innate selves in these ways. So for example, a far imposter, something that we are very familiar with, right? It doesn't need much invest investigation. It doesn't need, need much inquiry. This far imposter is what we may call cruelty or hatred. Right? In our own lives, we have very familiar relationships with it. Or we know other folks and we are able to see it very clearly when we need to be a resource in that way. When we need to honk the horn to kind of come in the middle and be a resource, compassionate wisdom resource in that way. But that type of sound, that type of reactivity in that horn, we can, we're known with that. We have some familiarity with that. That's more reactive. What we're looking for is more of an appropriate response. The near imposter, the one that takes a little bit more investigation, some of the curiosity, we name this as pity, P-I-T-Y. 
right? When it's this energy when we are either looking down at someone or separating someone from our experience. We're not connected. We don't understand that we're interconnected in this life. We pity that being or that situation. Oh, I'm glad that's not me. There are ways in which this shows up and it can masquerade as compassion. Many of our ways in which we donate to charity. We feel as if our money can do our talking for us. In many cases, it is a representation how we can extend our reach to places. But if the intention and in how we're giving is like, oh, look at those poor people. I, you know, I, I can pity that situation. I'm glad that's not me. Here's some money. That's not compassion. We're talking about true interconnected compassion, honoring everything, all things, the foundation of everything as love. I'm going to compassionately close here, reminding us again of Gil's words, where Gil says, <clears throat> let's pause for a moment, see if anyone else remembers Gil's words. Would you figure it out for yourself for a moment? We are talking about the fundamentals of love, the foundations of love. Yeah. So Gil says, what is most fundamental is love. Everything else is support to love or is the recipient for love. What is most fundamental is love and everything else supports love or is the recipient for love. And so this week we're practicing the recipients, compassion, self-compassion, understanding our capacities to be with what is in the moment, accepting, not condoning, nourishing our bodies, eating, being warm, sheltered, resting appropriately to be of service as best we are able in the world for others on behalf of others. Yeah. So that's all for my yip yap. <laughs> Thank you for your practice. Thank you for showing up here and best as you're able. Thank you for allowing me to enter into your space. Thank you. I'll scan the chat for a little bit just to see what any questions are coming up. Do this for about maybe five, 10 minutes. Um, I saw a question about the NAP or the organization. Um, I can't put it in the chat, but just look up NAP ministry, NAP ministry. Um, they may be napministry.org if you're on Facebook or Instagram, they'll pop up beautifully. You cannot miss them. They're very, very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, gratitude for the lovely raindrops, in Northern California. Yes, All right. In a way that the rain, in that element of the rain, the water that we talked about a little bit earlier, just noticing the elements, 
from an external perspective, but really from this internal perspective. When you notice even the fire element, the fire element that allows that warmth and that coolness to be known, but also the fire element, we can even look to nature in this way. I know it's it's hard within um, reconciling this within what's been happening with the wildfires, right? But may we learn from nature in these patterns as we rebuild, as we honor and mourn what we have lost. There's wisdom in these elements. For quite some time, nature herself has used fire to undo and rebuild to nourish the soil so that new growth can come up. So how are we learning from nature in that way? Yeah, the rainfall, it was raining here earlier this week. It took some while for us to get that level of rain and it, we recently got our first snowfall here as well. These rain elements, and it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, sorry for anyone if the audio quality was low for you. I don't know if that's um, my connection. Could be my voice. You may want to turn it up on your end or revisit this recording and turn it up on your end, see if that's helpful. Yeah. And I got a message from Kevin about repeating the reading. I think it may be what I shared from Tanisharo Biku. I'll repeat that here. It's from Educating Compassion. I'll read it one more time. It's a well-known principle in all meditation traditions that a moment's insight into the pain and present is far more beneficial than viewing the present moment with disgust and placing one's hopes on a better future. Once again, it's a well-known principle in all meditation traditions that a moment's insight into the pain of the present is far more beneficial than viewing the present moment with disgust and placing one's hopes on a better future. That is Tanisaro Biku, T H A N I S S A R O Biku, B H I K K H U, from Educating Compassion. Yeah. And so I'm going to stop here right now, yeah. And this is. Again, this is an embodiment practice. Being careful as we engage with these questions and these reflections of how we start to come up into this headspace, this cognitive space, and try to figure it out. This is not something that we're trying to figure it out. It's something that we're practicing to be with and then to understand. And from that place, allow yourself to go in and be it, investigate it for yourself, these elements, especially as Gil continues to guide us this week through Gil's perspective on compassion. Yeah. So again, deep gratitude to each of you. Um, I do hope to be at Insight Retreat Center sometime when we can be together in person Definitely at IMC. I was supposed to be at IMC last year. Something personal came up, but I'll make sure to be there in person at some point as well. Yeah. Thank you all for your practice. Be well to each other. Be well to yourself. <laughs>